In chapter 8, we're going to look at the details of sport and exercise psychology. In this chapter about sport and exercise psychology, we'll look at what scholars and professionals do in the field, describe how sport and exercise psychology evolved within kinesiology, and see how professionals in sport and exercise psychology engage in research and practice. In addition, we'll look at an overview of the major topics in sport and exercise psychology, including personality, motivation, arousal and anxiety and group processes, and also look at imagery, attentional focus, and mindfulness as examples of how mental skills training is used in sport and exercise. What we're trying to achieve with sport and exercise psychology is to gain an understanding of the social, psychological factors that influence people's behavior and performance in physical activity. Uh, we want to understand the psychological effects derived from the participation in physical activity and to enhance sport and exercise experience for those who participate. Looking at why we use sport and exercise psychology, uh, the study involves uh, human thought, emotion, and behavior in physical activity. So we look at the ABCs of physical activity. A is affect, uh, and that correlates with emotions. B for behavior, uh, correlating with actions. And C for cognitions, correlating with thoughts. Looking at what sport and exercise psychology professionals do, uh, as in the other professions we've looked at this far, um, it's popular for university professors to teach, research, and do service. Um, sports psychology service providers work in the athletic programs at the uh, university, Olympic, and professional level, working with athletes and coaches. And exercise psychology service providers work in worksite and um, corporate health promotion and fitness businesses uh, working towards uh, positive environments uh, for exercise. Exercise and sports psychology are two distinct fields in psychology. Uh, exercise uh, psychology focuses on the psychological aspects of fitness, exercise, health, and wellness, while sports psychology focuses on the psychological aspects of com competition in sport participation. Looking at the history of sport and exercise psychology, starting in the late 1800s, Norman Triplett studied the effect of presence of others on bicycling performance. And then during the Coleman Griffith era, Coleman Griffith was a professor at University of Illinois, and he engaged in the first systematic examination of psychological aspects in sports, and he devoted a significant portion of his career to sports psychology. In the 1960s, trait personality studies were conducted related to sport participation and sport facilitation uh, or audience effects on motor performance. Uh, national and international organizations were formed. And in the 1970s, sports psychology became a legitimate discipline uh, with graduate programs originated Renier Martin, pioneered the systematic study of competitive anxiety in sport, and the Journal of Sports Psychology began publication. In the 1980s, there was the emergence of exercise psychology uh, and growth in the field of research and explosion of applied mental training with athletes, which continued into the 1990s uh, when professional training standards were implemented, uh, consulting guidelines and ethical standards for exercise were approved, and the U.S. Olympic Committee uh, Registry of Certified Professionals was created. And in the 2000s, uh, we've had a continued uh, rapidly growing growing field of research, which has provided a sound foundation for sports psychology practice. Uh, and there's been a big increase in qualitative research, which typically involves interview data uh, and an expansion of consulting services and applied multimedia materials. Looking at research methods in sport and exercise psychology, 
some methods used include uh, questionnaires uh, that basically take a psychological inventory, interviews which are more in depth uh, with more complex responses, observations using a behavioral checklist or coding, looking at physiological measures like heart rate or brain waves. Uh, we can analyze the blood or urine for biochemical measures. And we looked at this in um, sociology, looking at content analysis, so analyzing written work such as activity journals. Looking at the six main areas of knowledge in sport and exercise psychology, they are personality, motivation, arousal versus anxiety, interpersonal and group processes, developmental concerns, and intervention techniques for physical activity enhancement. Looking at the effects of personality on sport and exercise, uh, for personality types in sports, um, they found successful athletes possess more positive self-perceptions and more productive cognitive coping strategies than less successful athletes, but there's no set um, traits that exist for an athletic personality. And then they have found the same for personality types in exercise. There's no set of traits, uh, but persistent and consistent exercises are more motivated and confident in their physical abilities than sedentary people. Looking at the effects of sport and exercise on personality, sport itself um, does not build character. Uh, moral development and pro-social behaviors must be modeled and created in the structure of the program. So if you're looking to send your child to go play soccer so that they uh, can have self-confidence and good sportsmanship, that's not going to happen unless the coaches and their teammates uh, encourage that sort of behavior. Uh, effects of exercise on personality. Uh, exercise has been shown to produce uh, um, a positive self-confidence concept and psychological well-being and decreased anxiety and depression. Looking at motivation, it is a complex set of internal and external forces that directs the and energizes our behavior. So our choices, our effort and our persistence in sport and exercise. So what sort of, of sports we choose to play, um, how hard we're gonna play, um, if we're gonna continue in that sport, that's all um, part of motivation. So all humans, regardless of their individual goals, are motivated to feel competent and self-determining. So everybody wants to get better. Everybody wants to feel like they know what they're doing. Um, and then we have both intrinsic and extrinsic motivation so intrinsic motivation um, is kind of how how uh, exercise or sport makes us feel. Uh, again, the competence do we do we feel like we know what we're doing on the field or on the court? And then extrinsic uh, motivation, things like uh, rewards um, to enhance our motivation. Looking at arousal and anxiety. Arousal is a state of physical and psychological activation or readiness. Anxiety is a negative response to a stressful situation characterized by apprehension and feelings of threat. And stress is a process in which individuals perceive an imbalance between their response capabilities and the demands of the situation. So arousal, uh, we'll look at uh, on the next page, there's the inverted U model of arousal to kind of look at what state is ideal for competition or, or participation. Uh, again, uh, anxiety is sort of this negative response and then anxiety can be brought on by the stress of this imbalance in feelings. So if you're playing a team that you know is so much better than you uh, that you don't have a chance to win, that would bring on stress and anxiety uh, and probably a low state of arousal. So with the inverted U model um, of arousal, we can see that 
um, there's a relationship between levels of arousal and levels of performance um, that basically has the sweet spot in the moderate level of arousal. So if you're too sort of amped up, um, aroused, then you're not going to perform well. If you're not amped up, you're not going to perform well. You want to get it kind of straight in the middle there. And this is kind of where sport and exercise psychology comes in to kind of do these precursors, maybe some meditation uh, or um, some visualization to kind of get you right where you want to be um, when it's time to perform in a sport. Looking at interpersonal and group processes in sport and exercise, um, we're looking at the presence of others. So this could be a good or a bad thing uh, in competition or in exercise. So um, we can have group cohesion or we can have social loafing. So in exercise, a lot of times you're encouraged to uh, exercise with a friend. So this encourages you to, for it to be a social experience. That friend motivates you. That friend encourages you to go every day because you're just not relying on yourself. So that would sort of be an example of cohesion. Um, also in sport, cohesion is you're together as a team. You don't want to let your team down. Um, you want to do your very best. Their up attitude influences you to have an up attitude. On the other side, we can have social loafing when we have groups or teams. So you feel like you have this big team and it doesn't matter what you do because the team is going to, you know, you might, if you're on a good team, you might feel like the team is going to do well no matter what I do. I have no influence. So that would kind of be the idea of social loafing. Mental skills uh, training and physical activity. This a lot of times refers more to um, sports psychology than exercise psychology, but it does have um, about half of these things do have a, a definite effect in that. Um, so goal setting uh, with exercise, um, you're trying to set goals. Um, to meet them and then mentally um, as you're exercising. These goals come into your mind to make you do a better job. Again, same idea with self-talk. Um, you want to have positive self-talk, uh, you know, sort of idea of you can do better or, um, you know, trying to meet those, those goals in your self-talk. Uh, then also attentional control and focusing, focusing on elements of, of the sport or what you're doing. Uh, imagery is very big in sports psychology, imagining uh, positive outcomes. I always laugh when uh, people talk about sport imagery. I remember when I was in college, I played uh, tennis and my doubles partner was very, very tall. And she did have a habit of not getting uh, volleys at the net over, which is almost physically impossible because she was so tall. And one day our coach was trying to get us to do imagery. And she said, every time I imagine it, I hit the ball in the net. So that would be a um, example of negative imagery that you would want to um, cancel out with players. Um, and then there's physical relaxation techniques, things like meditation. Um, and there's a lot of research documenting the importance of these mental skills uh, in preparing you for peak performance. So one of the things we try to prevent with mental skills uh, is choking. Um, it's kind of a common uh, term in, in sports. It basically comes on when you have an increase in arousal brought on by stress and pressure uh, that make the individual become more self-focused. Um, so when we look, if we look back to the inverted U, um, when you put too much pressure on yourself, you're going to get to either usually that increased um, arousal point uh, where we want to be in the middle. So. Um, if you have too much self-focus or if you have a negative self-focus, uh, focusing on inadequacies, uh, then you're going to kind of have a choking effect. Um, in your book, you can um, look at the passage on choking, what we can do about it. Mindfulness is increasingly used by people in sport and exercise to enhance their performance and mental health. So this would be a method you could use to prevent that choking. So you want to maintain focus on the present moment in an open, non-judgment 
judgmental way, um, the intent of mindfulness is to engage fully in the present activity without getting caught up into worries of the future or regrets of the past, so worrying about the last game or the next game or the championship. Uh, often taught through the practice of meditation, uh, other mental skills are important for success, um, including um, energy management, self-awareness, and productive thinking. Another one of our goals with sport and exercise psychology is to prevent burnout. So burnout is kind of the idea, the stages of burnout are feelings of mental and emotional, physical exhaustion, uh, then moving on to negative moods and feelings, uh, dis depression or despair, um, negative responses to other people, so that could be teammates or coaches, um, people at the gym, fe a feeling of lack of accomplishment and feeling disillusioned um, with your involvement, um, personality con characteristics that interact with life stressors. Um, so basically burnout comes on from um, a stillness with activity. Um, you feel entrapped. Maybe you're on a team. You feel like you can't quit the team and you have this lack of enjoyment. Uh, so what we want to do to prevent burnout is uh, to make activities more challenging, give more variety. If you're a coach um, or a, um, a psychologist, what you're trying to do is make the activity exciting again. You don't want to, if, if um, everybody's always focused on conditioning and they're there for the love of game, then you're going to get burnout. Not that you can't, you know, do conditioning, but you have to have um, challenges each day.